Apple again. So you'll only find that on Apple devices. All three of these inputs you will find on hard drives. So they do vary in speed of how quickly they transfer back and forth, but for what you're going to want to do, that's not going to be your, your uh, bottleneck. Um, as far as, you know, talent is going to be the, the key piece, right? But uh, it'll transfer just fine, uh, even with a USB 2 uh, connectivity. A MATI port is a, a special optical type connection that can run 64 channels of audio back and forth. Who would want that? Somebody <laughs> making a movie. Somebody making a big movie. Somebody making a big movie, absolutely. Somebody doing Mad Max. Yeah, for sure. Big studios, right? Yes. Working studios where you need to have a lot of tracks for different instruments. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Maddie, you can find in actually some of the gear in the recording room. So, I thought maybe you should know what that is. Chances of you buying it as a 101 user, pretty minimal. Yes, sir. What's Maddie like compared to MIDI? Uh, well, Maddie and MIDI are not related in any way. Uh, Maddie is actually a, an audio transfer protocol like, like Thunderbolt Firewire USB, and MIDI is the exchange of, of notation. We're not going to dig into MIDI tonight, it's course all by itself. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, check the minimum requirements for software. That's critical. So what I'm going to do is go on my computer right now, and I'm going to just point out to you on the screen what the specs of my computer are. So to do that in the Windows world, you click Start, Control Panel, go to the System tab, and you'll see that I'm running Windows 7 Professional 64-bit with 4 gigs of RAM. Anybody want to comment on that? Is that super speed or is that okay? Or It's good enough, that's for sure. That's about how I put it. You can think about these things too, like an i5 with 2.5 gigahertz. Sometimes that those specs are on the outside of the box, but they're less relevant than knowing what your operating system is and how much RAM you have in your computer. In the Apple world, you'll hit the Apple in the upper left-hand corner, and you'll get info, and it'll tell you the specifications of your, your computer. All right. Dare I ask, any questions on computer requirements? Wow, you're being very kind. Okay. We're moving right along then. All right. Let's talk about the audio interface for a moment. So a lot of people are scared of this part. They walk into the store and they're looking for help. They know they need one, and they're just waiting for somebody to tell them, yeah, the $1,000 piece should do just fine. Well, that's not the case. You don't have to spend $1,000 on it. I'll tell you why you might, um, but this doesn't have to be as scary as you might think. So first of all, they come with two, four, or eight inputs on them generally. So I'm going to use one with two on it tonight. Why am I doing that? Yeah. Because we're using two uh, things. Two sources, a microphone and a guitar, right? So what about these ones with four? Who would use that? Yeah. Larger yeah. band. Yeah, maybe I want a bass guitarist, a guitarist, a vocalist, and a uh, cajon player, right? So four sources going in at one time. How about an eight in input unit? Sorry? Recording drums. Recording drums, yeah. Five or six mics on drums, etc. And what was it you were saying? Oh, choir. Choir, absolutely. Now, if I have eight inputs, how many tracks can I have in my digital audio workstation? Eight. No, it's unlimited. So back when we were recording in the 80s, uh, and we were talking about a unit earlier that had six channels in and only four tracks, usually the number of inputs equaled the number of tracks that you would have. Not anymore. Now it's all about whatever your audio interface can take in, that's how many instruments I can record simultaneously. <coughs> but then I can make another bunch of tracks and record another eight, and so on and so forth until I hit my track limits, which are usually either 32 or unlimited. Do you, hear, do you understand the distinction of the difference? Okay, cool. So. Uh, an eight input device, just to be clear, if I had a, a band and I was trying to record everybody live off the floor, I could plug in the kick, the snare, two overhead mics, guitarist, bassist, vocalist, and one other person. That simple. Okay? Makes you a little less afraid now, maybe? All right. Is, is there, um, I'm just trying to think here for, if you're recording an orchestra or something, where everybody's mic stand. 
do you have like it's literally I would I would embed them as aggregator devices where you plug microphones into one aggregator and that goes into one channel into the, into the audio interface. Yeah. So the question is if you had say maybe more than eight people, is there such a thing as say an aggregator that could allow me to add more units? I'll give you my best 30 seconds on that. In the Apple world, one of the advantages are I could plug in 10 interfaces and make them into one, calling it an aggregate device. So I can have 10 interfaces of eight inputs each and have 80 inputs if I want to. Can't do that in the PC world, unfortunately. They only recognize one unit at a time. Now there are some exceptions where these units can be stackable. So I might be able to get two RME units that are the exact same plug in their two firewire ports, and I can get 16 channels. Those are your two ways that you can get aggregate connections. Great question. Awesome. Now, I talked about this already. Pro, pro products can go up to 64 inputs. Okay, so now you know. Now this might be a conversation point. So better units help to reduce latency. So latency is something that's come up since we started recording in the computer world. And I'll explain it simply like this. Latency is the amount of time that it takes for my voice to get into the mic, to the interface, to the computer, back to the interface, into my headphones and into my ears. It sounds like a long trip, right? What if I told you it only takes about 20 milliseconds on average to do that? It's pretty fast. Well, what if I told you that any delay beyond 12 milliseconds is audibly different from what you're giving it? So, if I sing into a, uh, a, an interface and into the computer and record it and I have my headphones on and it's at 12 milliseconds or less, I won't notice any delay of any type. It'll sound just like my voice coming right back to my head. However, if I get up to say 20 milliseconds, it'll start to sound like a second voice. I'll hear my voice and I'll hear kind of another slightly delayed voice, like a chorusing type sound, right? If I get to say 40 milliseconds, it's going to sound like an all-out reverb and not the kind of reverb that you like. It's going to sound like a voice that's just really behind. And once you get past 40 milliseconds, it really starts to sound delayed. So I want you to envision this. Let's say that you're in a stadium and you're singing the national anthem and all that you have to hear yourself are just the speakers up in the rafters. Do you think that you could sing the national anthem effectively with that kind of monitoring? No, it can take as much as a second for that to get back to you. And it'll sound real confusing because you'll sing a note and you'll be waiting for it to come back to your head and you'll sing another note and wait for it to come back. You just can't do it. And that's why they put a little speaker on the ground in front of you, right? So you can hear yourself in real time. What the people hear far away is different, but that's a lot of latency, like 250 milliseconds to a full second away. In the computer world, we can hear those differences really, really clearly. And that's why you want to get down to about 12 milliseconds. Now I'm going to reveal my cheats for tonight. The device, as you pointed out earlier, you know, sometimes they come with software. The device I'm going to use tonight, it doesn't actually come with any software. And it comes with no digital audio workstation, no drivers, nothing. In fact, a lot of people buy that device. It's very, very popular in the US for those that want to plug in a sound card to their computer and just simply listen to music off YouTube. It's great for that. But if I want to do some recording, the best I can get straight out of the software is 44 milliseconds. That's not good, right? So if you search the internet and you want to write this down, there's a driver called ASIO for all, A-S-I-O, number four, A-L-L. -L. And what that is, is it's a driver for any audio interface that does not have its own driver software. Now, about 90% of the, the uh, audio interfaces that you buy will come with driver software, and of course, they'll start in the 129-ish range, but that's part of what you're saving money on in the less expensive units. So I've added in as ASIO for all tonight, and I got my interface down to 16 milliseconds, which is okay. It's not great, but it's okay. For our purposes tonight, it'll be more than good. Does anybody have any questions on latency? Where do you find out what the latency is? That's a fantastic question. <laughs> so the question is, where do you find out about latency? You will, we're going to see later on. I'll open up the DAW and we'll start working with it. And I'll show you where that number shows up so that you know what to do with it. Okay? Now, I'm going to step over this way and actually grab my uh, audio interface so we can talk a little bit more about it. I'll come right back. OK. 
Okay, so the next point is that better units, uh, sorry, basic units come with a unique blend option. So, manufacturers typically want to make products better at lower prices, right? Now they realized that at this sub $300 price range, it was really tough to make an audio interface that didn't have these latency problems. So they thought hard and said, you know, what can we do to actually make these things have less latency without pouring a lot of money into the technology? So they came up with this blend knob. And basically how that works is, if I turn this knob all the way counterclockwise, and I sing into my microphone, it goes voice to microphone to interface headphones back to my head. Doesn't even go to the computer. So the trip is a lot shorter, right? In fact, there's zero latency. That's pretty cool, huh? If I turn the knob the other way, the sound coming back from the computer to here comes back at very minimal latency, like eight milliseconds. So I hear that with low latency. The only problem is when I turn it to either extreme, I only get one or the other. So if I had it turned totally right, I could hear what's coming back from the computer, but I can't hear myself singing. So you take this knob and put it somewhere in the center, and you get a blend of what's coming back from the computer and what you're putting into it at half the latency that you would normally have. So that's how an $85 device can actually become very effective for recording. Does that make sense? Yeah? There's only a couple of you smiling, so I don't believe you. Cool. Yes, sir? Uh, I'm not sure if this is what's actually happening with that thing, but wouldn't it be just more effective to uh, make it so that uh, both of the things are turned on so as to where it sends uh, the audio to the computer, but then doesn't send it back to your headphones and rather just takes a second stream of that audio and then is it right to the device and then back to your headphones? Did everybody catch that? Yeah? Okay. The only problem with that is, let's say that I sing a line to my song but I can't hear it come back. How am I gonna sing harmony to it? Uh, I mean like, what if, I mean, uh, never mind, I guess. No, no, it's okay, you're on the right track. Here's what happens, you, what, what that knob I'm gonna to do tonight, I'm gonna to put it right up the center, so that the volume of what's coming back from the computer is gonna be the same volume as what I'm sending into the computer. We have to send it to the computer to record it, right? But I also need to hear it back from the computer. I, don't, I want to hear what I'm singing in real time, so I just want to go to the interface and to my head for me to listen, but it still needs to go straight through the computer to be recorded. So it's a little bit of, of trickery, I guess, but that's how it does it, is it, it allows you to do what you call direct monitoring. You may have heard of that term before. Yes? So with that latency, how does that uh, change if you're going to add a little bit of delay reverb on the Oh, great question. So the question is, how does that change the latency when you start to add plugins like reverb and delays and so on? It does affect it because again, the computer's gotta work harder to make those things happen, right? So sometimes when the computer's working too hard, you have to extend the latency a little bit for it to be able to not work so hard. Yeah, put it, put it in, le taking less samples, or actually, my apologies, more samples um, at, at one time so that uh, it's not taking as large a sample. So it's a, there's a bit of balancing act that goes on with computers, especially computers that are five years and, and older. But, I mean, if you're using any Mac product today, it doesn't matter if it's five years old, it'll handle it. Any PC that's younger than five years old, uh, it'd probably be just fine. So far, so good? Does it still feel like 101 to you? And to you use some effects with the, um have an effects processor plugged in, yeah. then it's not going to be computer work harder, is it? Correct. The question is if you have an effects processor, maybe a floor pedal, and you plug that into the computer, it's not going to make it work any harder, and that is true. That's the same as plugging in a microphone or any other audio source. All right. Now, it may come with a DAW software included. Somebody can tell me what DAW stands for? Yeah. Digital Audio Workstation. I'm gonna have to start giving you prizes, I think, right? You got a quick hand there. If this was Jeopardy, you'd be way out ahead. Cool, and here's a few examples of them. Maybe you can give me some examples as well. Anybody heard of Pro Tools before? Cubase, Logic, Sonar, uh, Pro, uh, sorry, uh, FL Studio, Ableton Live, Studio One, 
Uh, did I miss any? Oh, uh, Garage Band? Reaper. 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 Traction. Traction. Adobe Audition. Audacity. Audacity. Yeah, lots of them, right? Now, which one is the best DAW? Does anybody know? <laughs> one you can make work. <laughs> Very close. <laughs> the best DAW is the one that the 18 year old down the street's using, right? Because they're your tech support. Or the one that your buddy's using, because they're your tech support. There is no such thing as a best DAW, despite what some people will want to tell you. Uh, they all have their own merits. You can get some that are very inexpensive with a certain amount of features, and then you can actually move up the line within that very family and get more features. The DAW that you're gonna enjoy the most is the one you're gonna use the most. It's like Microsoft Word. Most people know how to use Microsoft Word, right? But I can tell you that most people use less than 10% of the capabilities of Microsoft Word. Same thing's gonna happen with your DAW. If you need to turn the thing on, you need to connect up the interface and actually work with it. And then you may outgrow it, but work with what you've got. Any questions about the audio interface? Painful? No? All right. Shall we move on? Cool. Okay. So let's talk about microphones. So who in this room owns a microphone? Very cool. You want to give me some examples? SM58. SM58? Yeah. SM57. 57. Perfect. What else? SM7B. SM7B, another great mic, yeah. ARTM2, God love you. Cool, yeah, lots of mics out there, right? How about the, what's the most commonly used mic in the world? Does anybody know? Sure, SM58. The SM58, yeah. And what is it mostly used for? What purpose? Um, live vocals. Live vocals, right? It does something that's really, really cool that people love. First of all, it's meant to be dropped, right? So drop it, <laughs> neck performance. Yeah. Second of all, it's got this really neat property that if I'm holding it in my hand and singing, the rest of what's going on behind doesn't really usually come through that microphone. It picks up what's in front of it, and that's what it's intended to do. Yeah, you can get feedback if you turn the gain up too loud, but at the end of the day, it's a live performance mic meant to shut out everything else and just take in what you're singing into it. Now, the thing about an SM58 is that you also need to turn its input volume up quite a way. So if I have a mix board, the very top knob on the channel is the input or the gain stage. And you need to crank that up to make that microphone work. Now, what's the challenge about increasing input volumes? What does it also increase? Feedback. Feedback is one thing. What else? Noise. Yeah, noise, like hiss and stuff, right? Is that good for recording? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> you got tons of recordings like that, right? Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, we, we, wanna, we try to uh, lessen the, the hiss as much as Not possible. Not on purpose. Sorry? Not on purpose. Not on purpose, yeah. Well, maybe I can help you with that. So yeah, we're gonna talk about two different types of mics, dynamic and condenser. We just started to talk about the SM58, which is a dynamic microphone. Now, a very common property of dynamic mics is this. They require more gain, but they're also much less detailed. Meaning that, yes, I can pick up my voice with that microphone, and I can pick up subtleties in my voice as well. What if I want to pick up reverb tails from my voice? Not so easy. What if I want to pick up the sound of the room? Not so easy. Now the sound of the room with this, I can hear a fan going on the projector. I don't want to pick that up, right? SM58 is great for that. But I also don't want this hiss. So, but there are times where a dynamic mic in the studio really makes good sense. Can anybody tell me when? Yeah, kick drums, because they're also, they're very loud to start with, right? So I don't really have to turn the gain up a whole lot to pick up a kick drum. I can keep the gain low. But yeah, anything like a guitar amp or anything that's already very loud to start with, dynamic mics don't hurt. Or, if it's the only mic you got, that's the one you use, right? Let's talk about that a bit more. So again, dynamic mics are often used for live applications. Conversely, condenser mics are pre-powered. They use something called 48 volt phantom power. You ever heard of that before? Yeah, that's not the switch that when you press it, it gives you ghost activity, right? It's not that. This is the one that gives you, starts the engine for your condenser mic. So if I have 16 channels of one condenser mic, do I have to turn the phantom power on? Absolutely, even just with one microphone. Does it affect the other 15 channels? Not at all. So you can have that thing on all day and you not even have a condenser mic and plugged into it, still won't affect it negatively. So that's a common lore that I hear. So because it's already got the engine running before you ever turn the gain up, you don't have to turn the gain up a whole lot to get these things to fire. 
Now, if I want to pick up the sound of a acoustic guitar, an SM58 will pick up the pluck of the string. It'll pick up the note resonance as well. But I can take this condenser microphone, and it's also going to pick up the reverb tails, you know, those little sounds that continue along with a resonating string. It's also going to pick up the sound of the room that I'm playing in. If I was in a concert hall, I'd really like that. If I wanted to put, have a piano recorded in a concert hall, part of what I'm recording is the concert hall. So having condenser microphones there is a, is a great additive. And again, the key point, I don't have to turn them up very loud to make them work. So therefore, condenser mics are generally used in recording applications. We talked a bit about the crossover of both, but do you get the general idea there? Somebody mentioned an SM7B. It's one of my favorite mics to work with. That microphone needs a ton of gain. You gotta crank your input volume almost to the top just to make that thing work. But when it does, it sounds really nice and full <coughs> with a bit of hiss. Any questions about mics? How far away from a speaker or kick drum is like the real one? How far away from a speaker or a kick drum? Man, if we could answer that, we'd all be millionaires. It's just trial and error. Yeah, in fact, whenever I'm recording a, uh, a, a, a guitar amp, for example, I will sit at the console and listen. I'll have a person play the guitar, and I'll have another person just to move that mic an inch at a time around the speaker. And you'll hear the sweet spot. You can't mark it with an X because if you put it in a different room, it's going to sound different again. But that's the real way to record an electric guitar is to have somebody place that mic in the right spot, tighten up the clamps on the stand, and start playing. But great question nonetheless. And kick drum too, it totally depends on whether you have a port or not. Absolutely. Yeah, kick drum, I mean, some people like to put it inside the, the port, some have it outside. But again, same trick. You might have one pillow in there, and it sounds, uh, you know, still alive. Put a second pillow in, it sounds muffled just right. And then putting it an inch back from the head, laying on the pillows will sound one way, three inches back will sound different again. So again, a lot of experimentation goes on. Yes, sir. So the question is, if you're recording two sources at the same time, like a, a, a vocal and a guitar, would it be better to use uh, dynamics instead of condensers, right? Because they won't pick up, do crossfeed thing. The answer to that really is no, because you'll get better at your recording techniques. And there's a lot. Neil Young is a person who will not perform uh, without his guitar. Like he won't record just a vocal without the guitar, because there's a feeling that goes along with that, right? The hard part about that is if it makes a mistake on the guitar, the vocal track's gone too, right? So there is a bit of bleed. Even if you had a dynamic mic, you'd still have some bleed. But lessening the amount of bleed isn't going to take, isn't going to help the beauty of the recording. So my, my advice in this whole seminar is going to be one thing. You can have the cheapest gear on the market, and you can have an amazing performance, and it won't matter what, what gear you have. If you haven't seen it yet, you've got to go on to YouTube and check out uh, Guy Plays Toy Guitar in Walmart. Have you seen that? And this guy picks up this plastic guitar and he plays the blues on it. And it sounds incredible. And that's because he's just an amazing player. So spend your time not worrying so much about whether you get bleed so much as making sure your performance is good. I would do it in two separate tracks, ideally. But if you're Neil Young, you do it your way. Any other questions on microphones? Okay. Actually, yeah. yeah. Um, some of the older mics, uh, back in the day, my dad was a accordion player. Yep. And they never had the XLR connection style, but yep. it was a recorder instrument. Yep. Is there a difference between the quality that you're getting out of the lower and those type of connection? Models? Oh boy, that's a great question. Uh, I personally haven't used such a mic. Um, and I can't comment on whether that mic would have been, I, I'm sure at the time it probably would have been well, top sure, notch. I'm sure. I think Oh, SM57 is a standard microphone. Yeah, that's, that is commonly referred to as an instrument mic. Uh, but it was a screw-on type? Yeah. Yeah, it was just the termination. We're not going to talk about that kind of connection tonight, but we will talk about four different types of connections. But I don't know that that would have much to do with the mic's quality so much as that was the standard at that point. Yeah. Yeah? Um, do you need a reflection filter to just need in, if you're just using a cardioid? 
You mean a cardio condenser mic? Yeah. yeah. So the question is, do you need a reflection filter if you're going to use a cardio condenser mic? I'm going to talk about reflection filters a little bit later on. The answer is no, you don't need one, but it does help. If I have my microphone right here and a, a reflection filter right there, chances of me picking up the whir of that um, uh, projector, it gets minimized. So every type of isolation that you can put in is going to help. Do you need it? No, but it helps. Because I think they start about 150 bucks. Right? Yeah, okay, cool. All right, so let's move on to headphones. Now, um, who has a smartphone in this room? Okay, so more than half of you. So you all have a set of uh, earbuds then. Now, I'm not going to tell you that earbuds are the, a great tool for either recording or mixing, but they're a fantastic tool to listen to your final mixes on. 